So, I saw some of the basketball speed is really stuff you did with uh, Stephen Bennett. Uh huh. So if you had him from off season, preseason, in season, how would that change or progress, kind of going through? Well, I won't, and I don't. Okay. Um, I just think. I mean, it's a needs analysis, and I'll answer your question better here. But with Steven specifically, like, you know, he's got to be able to close out, and then he's got to be able to cut the guy's first move off in two dribbles. Right? So you put him in a position, just like anything else, that you got to do that. Right? Make sure he can close out, first of all, which is deceleration. Um, make sure when he finishes his deceleration, he's in a position to make the next play. I think that's something that's often not talked about um, or coached. Yeah, you came to a stop. But you're off balance, you're on the wrong place on your feet, uh, you're too high, you're too low, um, you, know, you, any, you know, your shoulders are here, you know, and maybe your trunk has leaned forward too much. I mean, you can list a number of factors. And it, and it you know, decreases your ability to, or diminishes your ability to make the next play. And, so, and that's sports. Field sports are always about the next play, field and court sports. So, we always said, you know, it's not about the deceleration, it's about the reacceleration. I put a little dash in my name under his name. <laughs> the way I teach a lot of speed and agility, I don't think there need to be hour-long speed and agility courses. Even when I, in like, when I was teaching, speed, like that, my, my courses, my classes were speed and agility. I mean, we're really we're only talking, you know, 20 to 30 minutes of it. You know, there's a there's a college here in town that, you know, does an hour and 10 hour and 15 minute sessions, and that's no longer speed and agility. That's conditioning. But no, to, to answer your question about preseason, off season, in season. Uh, I mean, yeah, you can you can absolutely, you know, play with intensities and volumes, um, but this is a skill. It's no different than going in the gym, you know, for a basketball player and working on your form shooting every day. You know, you should come in, you should work on the basic movements. You know, that's why I put like a lot of crossover steps, hip turns, uh, you know, landings, decelerations, etc. You know, low low intensity, low skill stuff in warm ups because you know they got to have that foundation. Um, uh, but yeah, I mean, like you know, you would, you could, you could taper it through. You know, you can make the most intense stuff in the off season, and, and then I would keep the intensity really high, but decrease the volume in the preseason, and make sure they're just really sharp. You know, don't accept bad reps. And then in season, maybe it's just part of your warm up where you know you're just making sure they have it and it's maintenance. You know, you can follow the same, you know, training methodology as, as you would like with strength training. Okay. Can that make sense? Yeah. Holla. When you say basic movements, what do you mean? Um, and so, I mean, just like simple, like lateral deceleration. So if you just think of the movements, you know, when it comes to court sports, like the, you know, so there's, there's lateral deceleration, there's lateral, you know, acceleration, right, or lateral power. There's linear, uh, and then there's multi-directional movement. So I always make sure that people can do a hip turn. I make sure they can do a crossover step. I make sure they know how to shuffle appropriately with, with, with proper tempo. Um, and, and shuffling is not like a, it's not a, a grunt movement. It's not a muscle movement it's it's in it's it's quick you know you're trying to get to your next shuffle faster okay and I think speed and intensity gets you where you want to go more so than than force just brute force you know it's 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 a momentum based movement so you want to get there fast um, so you know hip turns crossover steps lateral shuffle uh, which would be lateral acceleration uh, lateral deceleration, linear deceleration, and acceleration. And you know, you don't have to put all these in a warm up, but uh, especially with court sports, field sports that require multi directional movement, I just make sure that they know how to, you know, put an exercise that makes them have a good plant angle. So you're just reinforcing that position. Um, you know, makes them move at a good height, you know, and which is not the same for everybody. I, so with Steven, we raised him up an inch or two, and he was significantly faster and he felt that he was faster Now his coaches yell at him get low get low get low because that's what's been ingrained in our coaches for a long time that noise sounds when I make a good point um, <laughs> but they're also going to get mad at him if he sits down low and he can't sh cut a guy off he can't cut off the baseline so literally this happened he raised up and in that drill the next time he did that he closed out cut a guy off and they were like yes see what happens when you sit down low and I was like yes see what happens when you move at the right height <laughs> which is not sitting down low for him you know which is gonna be different for every person you know and so uh, but yeah I just kind of cleaned this up and ramble but you know hip turn crossover lateral acceleration deceleration good plan angles it could be a low box 
it could just be uh, you know rehearsed rehearsed cutting, you know, uh, you know stutter step cut, go to the next cone, you know, just angled cutting, you know, just like anything else. What does that athlete need? And then you know try to try to give them what they need. When you talk about height. How do you determine what is someone's A lot of it's eye, but like, you know, with this one particular kid, I, I know he's got a bad squat, you know, and he, he has, uh, you know, past issues that that are getting in his way. And uh, and so for him to sit down at maybe what would be considered a normal level of a defensive stance or an athletic stance, there's just too many restrictions throughout his body to do that. And so everything becomes forced and there's a lot of effort that, that is needed for him to move now, uh, and he, so he can't do it as fast. And um, it what's like the speed strength continuum there? You know, it, it, closer towards strength on the end of the continuum, like you're go, it's going to be slower movements. You know, so let's not put them in a position where they have to deal with a lot of resistance. Or and, and so let's put them down here. I played high. Michael Jordan played high. That's something that Michael and I have in common. Um, and but the only thing. yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, you know, you see, like I don't know if you like an Aaron Kraft for Ohio State a couple years ago was one of the best defensive players in the country. He plays low, you know. That's something that's where he plays well. And I just, I just don't think that you can, you know. It's like anything, anything else. We have a lot, you know, n equals one, right? So you can't you just hammer somebody into a, a, you know, a box or a shape because of this is what we want. Well, what do they want? You know? So you can't say that one particular position is the best position for a squad. Mm -hmm. Nope. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And because um, they're all coming with to play with different factors, right? Yeah. Yeah, limitations, whatever, you know, whatever it is. So, um, and it makes sense when we say it out loud, but we don't put it into practice. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, I know you guys aren't the same. I know I'm not, the, you know, the same as you guys. So, yeah, we're going to move differently. Yeah. I mean, that's why we do assessments. Yeah, exactly. Now. Uh, if, I mean, if you got FAI and you keep coaching someone into going, yeah, like, right. and they're like, Ugh. Right. and they can't do it with any force. You know, the uh, uh, functional squat test may be an indicator. I never thought about that. You know, but I'm sure there's, you know, if you're a three or lower, or well, three, four, yeah, yeah. three or better. Um, you know, I'm sure that correlates to the depth of your athletic stance. You know, if you're a two or worse, or you know, like a two, one, or zero, which you know, like I would be, you know, I'm going to play higher, you know, and I, and I think because speed and agility, if you want to call it that, is so much, you know, uh, based on elasticity, I don't think you, you have to load a ton. You know, I mean, there's, there's strength, there's a definite, you know, strength component, without a doubt, you know, but I've seen a lot of kids that are really fast that are really weak, and so they just, you know, maybe they're just more elastic. Turnover. Yeah, maybe they t yeah, absolutely. You know. I mean I, I couldn't live I mean I couldn't squat two hundred pounds, you know, but you know, I was decently fast and I could jump, but I was never gonna be the strongest guy on the team. Ever. Just the best looking. Would your approach change as far as <laughs> um, I know it's like similar vertical athletes like a volleyball player or a basketball player who needs like that I guess that ability to jump off jump off repeatedly. Would you change your approach? I know the N equals one, but the, I guess the generality of what volleyball needs versus what basketball needs. No, and I think we get caught up in sport specific. I think that's you know that's I think that sports spe specific training, I think is a sales tactic, All right? Um, because my sport specific training looks the same for almost every single field. And yeah, that's volleyball training. You did a hip turn. That's basketball training. You did a hip turn. Yeah, crossover step, you went from the middle on to, of the court on a volleyball over to the edge to get a block. Yeah, that's volleyball specific training. That's also soccer, baseball, basketball, football, tennis. You know. So these are fundamental movements that are there uh, in all athletic sports. Um, so if, if it makes dad feel better and, uh, that we say sports or sport specific, or if it makes them sign up, then go ahead. But Movement is movement, you know. Is squatting sport specific? It can be if it's going to help you know develop your vertical, you know, whatever. So. <clears throat>
You do have exceptions, though, right? Absolutely, you have exceptions. Hockey, maybe? Hockey, absolutely. Uh, absolutely. I think, I actually, it's funny you said because I just talked to a guy about hockey training yesterday. You're not going to have, and it, at least I don't see it, and, and Lance, if you think differently, say something, but like, um, you don't have the stretch reflex, uh, you know, in hockey that you do um, in, in, in typical core sports that aren't on ice because there is a period of, of acceleration in hockey with every step versus, you know, because you have, to, you have to drive versus, you know, I can change directions with just a quick little pl you know, plyo step, you know, in a, in a basketball or something like that or a core sport. Um, um, uh, yeah, every sport's going to have their little, t you know, twist on it. You know, tennis has to play higher because they have to see over the net. So if I'm training a 5'9 tennis player, uh, and I actually had this one time, and, and I was get down, get down, get down, and I realized, it, it was like his seventh session, I realized that's not how he plays. You know, he's gonna have to play tall. You know, now if I'm 6'3 and I'm a tennis player, that may be a different story, maybe I don't have to play as tall, but you still kinda do, you see all tennis players, they're upright. You know, so you have to train them in that position. You know, so yeah, there's absolutely gonna be some tweaks, but they're still gonna do a crossover step. You know, and they're still going to do hip turns and, and everything like that. So, but yeah, I mean, it does it does change from sport to sport, and I think hockey, because of the nature of, you know, the you know, the surface, uh, that makes it truly unique. So. How would you change that? Change what you do for a hockey player? Well, I appreciate you asking me a question. I don't know an answer to. Um, no, with uh, you know, I don't know. I haven't put a lot of thought on that. I've. We're in Indianapolis, Indiana. I know hockey's a little bit bigger in Indianapolis, but I've never had uh, I've never had much experience with I've had zero experience training hockey players. Um, I would put more emphasis. I think I would put less emphasis on plyometrics, um, and maybe still have them because I think that's an important athletic component. I do want to hear your opinion I on this. Thought. Yeah, um, and if they contradict mine, then, then so be it. Um, but you know, I would absolutely put a ton of emphasis on. Uh, obviously driving, you know, because you have to with, 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 with skating there, but so like, you know, linear acceleration would be a big deal to me, I think. But even then, in the hockey, you're not, it's not straight linear, you're actually a little bit of abduction, right? Yeah, Yeah. so your, your linear acceleration is way more frontal than you would think, yeah. and your deceleration is isometric. Like okay. It's because you don't, the friction of the blade on the ice is what stops you you just have to hold your position yeah. so you don't fall over. Right, right. Yeah, so that makes sense. So you really don't have, uh, uh, you know, like a, there's not a plyometric component yeah. a lot in that. Um, each push on uh, with hockey is almost like, I mean, even though there is a more frontal plane, you know, component there, is literally like taking off uh, or stride. There's a long ground contact time. And so, uh, I, you know, maybe there's a way to incorporate that in training more. Like bounding? Well, that's that's not a lot of that's that's actually. Like, um, I would say leaps more. You know, bounding is very okay. plyo. You know, bang. You know, but yeah. You know, maybe maybe some some leaps with some. You know, you know forward and lateral. Yep. Yep. Heidens, you know, stuff like that. But you know, you st I would still propel you forward just to get that component. So you said like natural movement is quickest. Is there any? What do you mean by that? Like, don't tell them how to step. Yeah. Um, so is there any <coughs> scenario where you would break somebody's movement down and teach them? Yeah, if we can improve it. Okay. Yeah. I mean, and what would you see to improve? I mean, that's a tough question. And this is why I don't think, like, speed and agility has just become such a garbage can term. You know, I really think it's been watered down. And I'm biased because that's what I do. But it's here's a ladder, here's some cones, and or here's a sled, and let's go. And, you know, those things may help. You know, they may give you a positive training, you know, benefit. But, um, you know, each person is different. I mean, I think you really, really, you know, it's like resets. You know, it's like our resets with our clients, you know. You may do an all four belly lift, that may do nothing for me, you know. Um, so I don't think that you can just say this is this is it, this is the way. Um, Steven probably stands taller than I would have more most athletes stand, but that's what works for him. Um, um, you can change stance. I mean, there are some things that you just need to change based on you know uh, you know based on angles and stuff like that. I think a better <coughs> question is what is the most 
consistent thing you see that people do incorrectly? Um, I mean, there's a number of things. I think plant angles are usually, you know, just an instinctive because you don't think about it, but they can be doing that one to protect themselves. Two, maybe they haven't, they don't know what a proper plant angle feels like. So this is something that I've only heard one other person talk about. If, if other people talk about it, then I apologize. But experience when it comes to speed and agility, especially changing directions, I think is a big deal. I think being familiar with positions, being familiar with uh, situations and environments that happen. Um, you know, like a, a you know, one reason bigs are, you know, they're in, they get in trouble in basketball when they have to go out and guard somebody is because they don't do it. You know, yeah, I know they're bigger and slower, you know, but like at the same time, they just don't do it. You know, so when I drive at you and cross over, you don't understand what should happen. And so, and I think that's a, I think that's absolutely a big deal. Exposure to situations and envi and that's even like environment, you know, and uh, and and we know that everybody has different strategies when it comes to movement. So like. You know, I don't necessarily have a, this is how we should do it. It's just, you know, how does it look? Does this make you faster if I drop you an inch? Does this make you change directions better if I put a band around you and pull you a little bit and now all of a sudden your plant angle is a quarter, you know, half an inch wider? You know, is that a better angle? Sure. You know, what, if we, what if we do something to stop a little bit of a, you know, less shoulder sway? Or what if we bring you down an inch and the shoulder sway less because you have a lower center of gravity now? You know, I don't it could be any anything, but those are just factors. You know, I, that's where I don't have a system to this stuff. I, there's a little bit of a system, but I don't have a like I, a lot of it's just I, and I know that's not great when you're trying to put things together. But it's just you see it. Trial and error. Yep. You know, there are some general rules. You know, I mean, understand angles. Um, you know, understand gait, force production, and you know, and and. Uh, and, and all that, but um, uh, but at the same time, you know, you got to understand your client too, and you got to understand the sport you're training. For baseball players, especially pitchers, you got to focus on a lot of frontal playing work. Absolutely. 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 And how much, I guess, speed and agility do they need? I think I don't. I think theirs is. I will do stuff with pitchers because I want them to maintain or have some sort of athleticism. Um, I just I want them to be able to feel things. Okay, and, and if you don't have athleticism, I, I, you know, and call athleticism what you want. You know, you know, call it the fastest guy in the field. Maybe I think the guy who has, <clears throat> I think the athlete who has more skills in their toolbox is more athletic. You know, uh, you know, Usain Bolt is incredibly. I mean, it's 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 amazing how fast he is. But you know, is he more athletic than than Steph Curry, who's a scratch golfer, uh, can shoot from 30 feet and consistently hit it, um, and and make amazing passes and dribbles? You know, on a court that's you know that things are moving a million miles an hour, and he can read his environment. That's a skill. You know, he can assess what's going on and transfer that into an action really fast. You know, but I bet he doesn't beat too many guys on a, in a sprint, you know. And so, um, I would say he is as much or more athletic than Usain Bolt, you know, without knowing a lot about either one of those guys, but just looking at their performance. And so, but so my point is, I want these guys to be athletic so they can feel things and they can make adjustments um, on their own. And you know, I think the more athletic you are, the better feel you have. Probably the better you pick up on new skills, you know, or you can adjust. Uh, but definitely a ton of frontal plane work with pitchers. Do you do a lot of like uh, band resistance stuff? Or? Sure. Yeah. You could do that. You know, make sure they have the basic qualities. You know, you know, if, you know, be able to evert off the mound so you can load the back glute. Um, and then uh, you know you have to be able to transfer that forward, so you have to be able to accept the load on the front side. You know, on that front leg. Um, and so there's you know there's. Throwing a baseball is really cool to me biomechanically because all three planes, I know all three planes come into movement, but it's such a fast action and, it's, and with, with high velocity intensity, it's really cool and, and you can't not have one, I can still run on a straight line without a frontal plane and a transverse plane, we see it all the time, you just, you know, your arms don't move and your, and your upper body doesn't rotate, but man, there's some damn fast guys that do that, um, but you can't pitch well, you know, without, uh, 
at least I shouldn't say you can't pitch well because there are guys that are making a living and have been making a living that do pitch well without a frontal and transverse plane. But uh, you also see them on the injured list a lot. You know, and, uh, and so we can name names. I don't want to name names. Uh, but uh, uh, you know, it's guys that you consistently see year in, year out on the injured list. And I, and I don't know for sure because I, I can't assess them. But you know, we can watch video and see. You know, this guy doesn't finish over his top hip. This guy doesn't flex his trunk. And this guy doesn't sis disassociate his, his hips from his, his trunk. You know. Yeah, yeah. You you don't either. You don't load. And so, uh, and it, you know, I you know I think eversion is a big deal to load that back glute because uh, different guys teach different or uh, teach different mechanics. But like, you got to be able to have a long stride. And I don't know if this is 100 percent right, but I think it's like at least your body length is like one times your body you, know, you want to be able to stride out and some guys like Lincecum does like one and a half times his body which is ridiculous like like how aggressive that is but like um, but yeah I mean if you can't load I mean you getting out how are you getting out there you know uh, it becomes a it becomes a reach with a front p foot now you're dissipating forces it's a lot of syllables <laughs> so when you say that speed and agility has become a garbage term. Mm -hmm. What is a either a better term or a better definition? I mean, it's like saying a secretary and a, an administrative assistant. I, I don't, you know, it's just training to me. You know, it's speed. What do you want? Like, sport speed? You know, I don't know. I think that's just my own personal like hang up on it. I just uh, you try to avoid being grouped in to what's happening over here because you don't agree with it. You know, and so. That's just all I'm trying to do. So, but um, like Lee calls it, multi-directional speed. You know, have at it. So the key indicators with strength and/or range of motion deficiencies, and how you would address those in the weight room or on the field while you're coaching, and then in the weight room. Um, strength and range of motion deficiencies. So like a kid. So I know one is the leg whip. Hank. And then, mm -hmm. um, so they can't decel, but yeah. like that's what I'm talking about. You ever hear Hank change directions? You should because it's a really heavy foot, and so he doesn't decelerate you know very well. Have you worked with Have you worked with Hank yeah, at all? I'm hearing it now. Yeah. It's like a drum. Yeah, like his last three steps are, he's yeah he's beating the ground. Um, <laughs> he does <laughs> Hulk smash. Um, I bet there's like an inch indentation like on when he's playing football in the field <laughs> where he changed directions. It's just flattened into the ground. He probably does really well in wet weather. Yeah, yeah, I know. <laughs> I'm stuck. <laughs> um, but like then like Nick who comes with him is, you know, so for the sake of the video, you know, Hank is a football quarterback and he's a, he's a well-built stocky kid um, who when he runs he leg whips you know which means his foot kind of comes out to the side and there's another kid that comes and trains with him that is a he's a slender very slender basketball and baseball player um, with a lot without a lot of relative strength but he's as quick as can be you know and, and fast on a straight line and things like that and you know when he changes directions it's it's sudden you don't you know you hear a little you barely hear it you know and I'm not saying be soft I'm just saying it shouldn't be a heavy action um, and uh, uh, and so, yeah. here's the side of that with Hank, and I'm not trying to say like, you know, I'm not trying to like use this as a you know get out of jail free card here, but yes, we try to work on him, but he's also pretty fast, not really fast, but he's pretty fast. Uh, he's got a good vertical, he's got a good he's got a good 10 and 20 time. It could be better, but he does it gets you know he, he does pretty well. Um, he is in a strength and conditioning program that isn't going to take into account biomechanics, his deficiencies, or whatever. And you've got, and you know, to their, to be fair, you know, you put 50 kids or more on a football team, it's not going to happen. You know, I mean, you'd have to have 10 strength coaches in there. You know, it's just not going to happen. And you have to make sure they're qualified, you know, which is not going to happen. And so, um, you know, we try to just bring Hank back a little bit on that spectrum. Give him some some you know freedom of movement, keep him healthy, and let him do what he does. Um, don't see him enough to to make changes like that. And I just that's I think that's just the way. Unless you're a strength coach for a team, I don't know if you're going to see kids enough to make real changes. And I don't again, I'm not trying to like 
get out of jail free here, but you, know, you guys have all heard me talk about that. So um, Hank would need a retraining process with that stuff. Uh, I would, I would, that's where I believe the weight room complements speed work a big time. And I don't know if anybody talk, I don't know how many people talk about that. I know we all lift weights to get faster, but I don't know if we connect the two, like truly connect the two as far as movement goes. Um, you know, we train hip extension in here, you know, all the time, you know. Uh, that's a quality that needs to be had. You know, uh, you know, whatever hip, you know, hip flexion with, you know, with hip extension, hip separation, whatever you want to call it. Um, you know, giving him adequate hip mobility, mainly internal rotation, so he doesn't have to leg whip. Make sure he can keep that uh, without load. Make sure he can do it under load and stress, and then make sure he can do it dynamically. And I think I I, I, haven't, I don't know if I've seen that process all the way through, but going through the process with athletes and just not having enough time to finish it, I think it takes a while. It's a lot of reps. No different than changing anything else. If I've always hit my tennis backhand like this, you know, and all of a sudden you want me to do it a different way or want me to go double two-hand backhand, uh, it's going to suck for a long time. When we were at BSNPG, there was a researcher there that was like, you know, we have the 10,000 hour rule. Mm -hmm. And the unfortunate thing is sometimes 10,000 hours is not enough right. to undo 100 bad hours. Yeah. Yeah. So you're up against it. You know, and I'm not saying give up. Like you know, I mean that's. That, I, I'm glad I like to hear that because that makes me feel better. But uh, you know, but if you can move him back on the spectrum a little bit, you know, maybe maybe all, maybe worst case scenario, you 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 give him a little bit more range of motion, you improve him a little bit physically, and he's able to load better in the weight room. So now he's using more of the muscles we want, and he's putting he's damaging his body less, which may help him recover better. So now he's automatically faster because his nervous system is recovered. We're loading better muscles, and he's stronger. Good, Hank. Go ahead. You know, so, I mean, if that's like if that's what we can do, awesome. I'll take that. You know, but there's just no ideal. I don't know if you guys know like Todd Marinovich, but you know, we don't have. I'm not taking my son if I had my hypothetical son, and from the age of three training him to be. Uh, a professional athlete 24 hours a day 365 days a week uh, that's just not going to happen you know we don't do that with these kids going back to Hank so in retraining him like you just don't accept bad reps where you just cut it short like cut it off yep. as soon as he absolutely as soon as you lose him absolutely and then so if he gives you four good reps and rep number five he's losing his position stop it and maybe you give them 90 seconds of rest and come back and do more. Like you can, st let's say you have, let's say you have uh, uh, four sets of six is what you want to do with him today, and and he gives you two sets of six, and then on the third set he only gets three and breaks down. All right, if you really want to get that volume in, you know, if that volume is important, that number, then just break it up. You know, make him do doubles, make him do triples. You know, uh, it doesn't have to be a double doesn't have to be 95 percent of your one rep max. You know, it can be. 80 to 85 percent you can pattern maybe 95 percent is too much stress so which it probably would be for someone that you're trying to retrain i might keep them like you know i don't know in the, for at least in that intermediate stage you know, 65 to 75 percent of their max and i wouldn't necessarily get uh you know up to you know more than five or six reps it'd be like an rpe of like a seven or eight you know until they can you know, just keep adding a little bit over time. So then what do you do with a pro guy? <laughs> with a pro guy? Yeah. I, you know, like I think you just, you just identify what they need the most. Like, um, you remember, were you ever meet Zach Seinberger, yeah. the soccer guy? Yeah. You know, I, I just kind of made a decision early on that I, uh, when he was getting ready for the combine, that sagittal plane work was not going to be a priority and that frontal plane work was and because of the position he played, and so we just focused on that for eight weeks, and it paid off. You know, he uh, he changed directions better. His combine time for his 5105 his pro agility test drastically went down, and uh, and he had very little elasticity. So we trained that that component. So there were three things with 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 him that we did. We focused on the neural component, you know, for a better efficient, you know, force production. 
Uh, we focused on the elasticity, the plyometric component, because that's what he needed. And um, we focused on frontal plane stuff. So we gave him some frontal plane stability in his hips, uh, which allowed him to change directions better. Can you give us a couple examples of what frontal plane exercises you did, like the side lunges? And well, I mean, you, you start out with, you know, like, like if we're doing PRI exercise, like an adductor pullback or right, you know, you know right clamshell. Uh, and then we progressed him as he demonstrated abilities, you know, to hold those positions well. And then, yeah, we used, uh, you know, even just a half kneeling chop or a half kneeling exercise gives you an opportunity to, to teach frontal plane. Um, so we started there in the beginning and then we, you know, progressed to things like side lunges and then um, uh, lateral sled drags and stuff like that, you know, something dynamic. And so, but definitely a lot of single leg work with him to control that. Um, a lot of, uh, you know, static half kneeling position in the beginning and then moved him up from there. And so, and he did a good job. Like he, he took advantage of the time that he had. Like he did stuff on his own too. Uh, and so, and I, it showed because there was literally from week to week, there was noticeable improvement. Good. Thanks for letting me talk, guys. I don't want to show too much leg on this video. <laughs> Ty wants to be an exotic dancer. Yeah, <laughs> that's not a stripper. <laughs> yeah. I can go as far as say entertainer. <laughs> so, absolutely. Edit this out. Yeah, no, nope. this, this, <laughs> this stays. <laughs>